How good are you at spotting a fake ID? You're probably not as good as you think. Bogus IDs are more sophisticated than ever. Even experienced bouncers have trouble telling fake IDs from real IDs. And selling cannabis to minors can result in huge fines, even cost dispensaries their license. That's why Veriscan by IDScan.net protects their dispensary partners by performing more than 75 algorithmic checks on each ID barcode. So if your dispensary is worried about inadvertently selling cannabis to a minor, you should look at Veriscan by IDScan.net. They're offering listeners to this podcast free white glove setup. Just go to IDScan.net and join over 1,000 North American dispensaries and 9 out of 10 of the largest MSOs who are confidently bringing plant medicine to legal age consumers. But look at where, like, see if you can notice without moving your eyes or your head, keep your gaze ahead of you. See if you can notice your hands. And then from that space, just notice your thoughts. And what I've found is, like I said, most people cannot focus on their internal problems as much because they've widened, they've literally biologically widened their perspective. Welcome to the Miracle Plant Podcast, the show that inspires, promotes, and gives you a daily dose of inspiration from the people who have used cannabis to change their lives in extraordinary ways. Here's your host, Justin Benton. Welcome back to the Miracle Plant Podcast, where we discuss this miracle plant with so many names and how it's helping people in so many extraordinary ways. Well, today we have a very special guest who's definitely uh, of the same cloth of the same, you know, birds that flock together of the same feather. We have ourselves Kimberly Spencer that is uh, on a on a mission, you know, to help people and empower people to take control of their mindset. And uh, I'll let her do a proper introduction of all that she does. But I know mindset's so important. One of the five pillars that we talk about here to have that holistic healing. Kimberly, welcome to the Miracle Plant Podcast. How the heck are you today? Thank you so much. I am so honored to be here. And I am just, uh, I'm doing phenomenal. Love it. Love it. Well, tell us a little bit about your journey, about how you got into, obviously, helping your own mindset and then paying it forward and helping other people's mindset. So tell us about your journey. I started out actually in the world of health and fitness. When I was 19, I needed a bridge job to balance out my then career in Hollywood. <clears throat> and I got certified as a Pilates instructor because at the time I was struggling with a 10-year battle with bulimia, hated my body and tried this thing called Pilates. And suddenly I was like, what is this magical tool, this process that cha- like literally made me feel good in my body? Little Now knowing what I know about the nervous system, I actually, Pilates is one of the forms of exercise like yoga and Qigong that allows you to activate your parasympathetic nervous system and then train your muscles accordingly as you're activating it. So um, uh, being having grown up in a house with an addict, I was very used to being in fight, flight, freeze, reactionary mode. My sympathetic nervous system was on overdrive. And so Pilates was such a gateway drug into holistic healing. And I got certified when I was 19 years old. Uh, Within a year, I'd become the highest paid, youngest, most fully booked instructor at the studio that I was freelancing at. And I had started to completely rewire how I thought about my body, how I thought about leadership, how I thought about service. And because I was also in a new environment, I started working with hundreds of bodies on, on a yearly basis. And because of that, the environment of exposure to different ideas, I mean, that's why I love podcasts like yours, because when you are exposed to different thoughts and different ways of being, it starts to unlock things in your brain where suddenly your brain is like, oh, there's, there's actually different ways to survive. Like it's not just how you grew up. It's not just what you thought you came from. And actually, so within two years, I'd rewired my, um, my mindset overcome came a 10 year battle with bulimia with no psychological or medical intervention. Um, and I saw from training all those people that 
it didn't really matter whether you, they were technically fat or technically thin or whether they exercise four times a week or not like once a week or barely at all. Um, what, I, what mattered was how they thought about their bodies. And that's how I started to see results um, with my clients and in really working with how they were thinking about the exercises of what they were doing. So fast forward um, 12 years later of teaching, I was, I had also received an opportunity to become the president of the e-commerce company. I got cert, uh, I was the president. We took this back stretching device to market. And then within two years, my business partner told me he wanted to buy me out and I was devastated. And it was then that I realized that the same subconscious fact though, that had built the, the, that I had rewired from my body. I, I was dealing with and seeing in my business. So the concepts of values, meta programs, attitudes, belief systems, decision-making strategies, all of these subconscious strategies were why my business partner and I did not jive. And so I, because we, I was bought out literally three weeks before, um, I got married, I was on my honeymoon wondering what I was going to do next. And I leaped off the couch and I said, crown yourself. And my husband's like, what's that? And I said, it's a like a holistic coaching model where, you know, we deal with, we work with somatically with the body, with, um, you know, with the, how the neurology works, how the, po how posture and the physiology directly impacts what your brain is thinking. And, you know, also from the top down and it's, it's combining relationships and business and all this problem was, was I hadn't yet really mastered my own mindset when it came to business and finances. And so I went through a relapse of what I call financial bulimia. So it wasn't actual physical <laughs> bulimia, but it was financial bulimia. Many business owners have been there um, where you receive money and then suddenly there's just all these bills that just go out and I, so I was in that space again of like fight flight. My neurology was going crazy. And then I found out I was pregnant and I realized it just hit me. It was that everything that it was, was a mindset issue and that I'd overcome like actual bulimia with no psychological or medical intervention. I just needed a process. And that was when I found NLP and timeline therapy and hypnosis. And I went and got certified in that process. And then I started making actual money in my business. And we've grown from there for the past seven years. And I worked with some amazing leaders from around the world, CEOs and serial entrepreneurs who achieve their three-year goals in, in one year's time or one-year goals in three months and have been able to fulfill their childhood dreams and transform their stories. So I've been, been hooked ever since. I love it. I love it. I love it. So tell me this now, um, um, do you work most, you, you work with men and women, or do you find yourself working with one or more than the other, or that's irrelevant? It's irrelevant. I work with about right now, it's currently actually 50, 50. So the, the men that I work with they're they see the value in the results. It, they don't care that my company is called crown yourself and that I I'm filled with yes, Queens and all that. Like they're like, as long as you can deliver results. Great. Mm -hmm. That's, that's interesting. So for for our audience, and I love, you know, the fact that you were at LLP, uh, NLP and like we talked about before, we're talking about therapy and Wyatt Winsmall, Dr. Wyatt Winsmall, uh, for those of you who don't know, also was one of the only people that Tony Robbins ever gave credit to in a book uh, as far as helping him with NLP before he renamed it, Intelligent Businessman, that Tony Robbins. And <laughs> so uh, if you wouldn't mind, maybe give a little, um, a little insight into um, that timeline therapy uh, just to kind of show people um, how it might work or how it might help. Just maybe a little taste of how that works. Yeah. So timeline therapy is, um, it's a combination of NLP and hypnosis. And what's great about it is because I've worked with a lot of clients who have had childhood trauma, I had my fair share of uh, childhood trauma as well. Traditional models of therapy is where you associate into the traumatic event. And personally for me, there are certain experiences I don't want to re-remember. So we have our events organized, our memory is organized in a, in a timeline, in essence. And when there's an emotional memory, sometimes it gets a little stuck. And so with timeline therapy, you go through and you eliminate the top five neg major negative emotions, anger, sadness, fear, guilt, and shame. 
And then any sort of limiting decisions or limiting beliefs as, as to the place of origin. You, so I've had clients, I had one client, um, it's probably be better. I, I prefer explaining in story rather than in just explanation because it, it, you can see it in a story. One of my clients, we were working together and said in timeline therapy, you asked like, was this in a past life or generational? And for those that don't believe in a past life, I always like to say, Your subconscious mind takes everything personally. So it could think that a past life is a horror movie that you watched one time. And it, because it had such an emotional impact, it, it accepts those suggestions as your own, which is again, which is why I don't watch horror movies. Um, So, and generational trauma, generational trauma has been very heavily studied. Uh, There was a, there was a scientific experiment with mice and cherry blossoms. And they bred, uh, they it had one generation of mice where they exposed the, the mice to a shock. And uh, so a trauma, whenever they smelled cherry blossoms, they bred the mice. And for uh, three to five generations, even though the following generations never actually received the sh- actual shock, when they scented cherry blossoms in their neurology, it responded exactly the same. So generational trauma is very real. It's been scientifically validated. And so when you are experiencing your timeline, um, in this example with my client, I was asked, you know, is, was it a past in the womb or before and, or in a past life or generational? And he said it was in the womb. And he said it was four months and we were working on the negative emotion of guilt. And so I had him take a tour on his timeline, which is just an imaginative process. It's, it's just using your imagination um, to actually see the, the length of your timeline. And he was in that space. We did the process and he just had this very visual picture of he was four months in the womb and a very visual picture of a motorcycle. And I said, I'm very curious, like, just call, just call your mother. Like after we finished the process and ask her, he called her and he said, she turned white when he said, did something happen when you were like four months pregnant with me with like a motorcycle? And she said, who told you? And he was like, what? <laughs> no one. And she said, yet yeah, your father and I were in a motorcycle accident. And I had such, pro- when I was pregnant with you and I had such profound guilt that I, pr- I made him swear that he would never say anything. We almost lost you. Um, and she was just racked with guilt. So it was, it was a generational, but it was also an experiential thing that he experienced actually when he was in the womb. So it has had, I've, I've seen it completely within literally minutes, um, eliminate years of, of fears or limiting beliefs, or, um, like for me, when I first experienced it, I had uh, 14 generations of anger that I didn't realize that I was holding on to. And the experiences was so transformational and so profound. And I remember it because prior to going into my certification, I was walking into the, into the hotel and I tripped and I had one of those reactions that was kind of like what I like to call a Jenga set of reactions. So when you have a negative emotion and you have unprocessed negative emotion, it's kind of stacks up like a Jenga set. And what timeline therapy does is it really takes out that bottom block of the Jenga set. So it just topples the whole thing. And, but I had the Jenga set built up of anger where I had a very visceral reaction to a very small problem. And I, it was, I was self-aware enough to notice that's a really big reaction. Well, fast forward to after I'd done um, the first uh, process of timeline therapy with releasing anger. I went outside, got a, got a snack and came back and I tripped in the same spot. And I remember being on like even worse than before. I felt nothing. It was the, and I was trying to search for, it was like, suddenly I was trying to search for something that wasn't even there. And my classmates saw me and they're like, that was the most peaceful trip I have ever seen in my life. And it was, it was really a magical experience. And it's not to say that like, you'll never experience anger or frustration or negative emotions ever again. You are human. We are living human lives. We experience emotions as we go. 
But what timeline therapy does is it releases those emotions that have been stuck in our bodies and our, and our bodies are physical somatic experience of how we experience, we experience the world through our bodies and our subconscious mind runs our bodies. So when we allow for that emotion to process through and release fully, instead of holding it on, holding on to it, um, when we hold on to it, that's when it starts to stack up like that Jenga set versus like what Dr. Jill Bolte has done in her research, where she saw that a feeling only lasts 90 seconds. But if we don't allow, if we stifle that feeling from fully processing through our bodies, then that's when it starts to build up. Love it, love it, love it. And here's the wildness of us, you know, finding each other is that I'm going to be on a plane in a week to go to Puerto Rico to go hang out with Dr. White Wood Small. And I will definitely be bringing up this uh, podcast episode and uh, oh, that's, yeah, gosh, that's amazing. I, I am yeah. so excited and, and honored. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll reach the, I'll, I'll make sure he gets this podcast and, and you guys can connect. He's just such a brilliant mind. And, and uh, I, I, that was, he'll be very proud and impressed by that explanation. So what is it that you would say is your most common uh, problem that your clients come to you with and how do you help them overcome it? I'd say the most common problem is what I call the pedestal problem. And it's a perception from people who have had success in a certain field or industry or past experience that they put in their minds upon a pedestal, forgetting the climb that it actually took to achieve that. And what happens is, is when you put your success up on a pedestal, pedestals are very wobbly, shaky services. Like, and the higher you build them, the more wobbly they are. But in order to achieve that success initially, you probably had to have lot, take lots of risk and do lots of acts of courage and bravery. And there were probably lots of challenges that got you to that point of climbing that mountain. And then once you have, were past it and through it, when I see clients put their success up on a pedestal, what happens is is they then are in a place where they feel stuck. They're scared to get move off the pedestal. Like I said, it's a very wobbly surface and they don't continue to take the big, bold risks that initially got them those, uh, those initial successes in the first place. And so what I work with my clients on is really examining and exploring the stories of how they got what they wanted in the first place. And then using their own subconscious success strategy to apply it to the next Everest that they're wanting to climb. Love it. Love it. Love it. So for, so for people that are, that are, you know, having these, these traumas or these things that they're holding on to, uh, could you maybe also walk us through an exercise of how to like, like let go, like just let go of those things or those subconscious, or how can you rewire your subconscious? Do you have some exercises or an example that the audience can, uh, can learn from you? Yeah. The, the first exercise is really super simple. It is parasympathetic activation of your nervous system. So you can do this within literally 90 seconds. And what it is, is it's breathing. And it's, it's, it's funny because I have so many clients who are so in their heads and they roll their eyes at this and like, oh my God, but take a deep breath. And then as you exhale, exhale longer than you inhaled. So if you inhale for a count of four, then exhale for a count of seven or eight. And continue to do this for 90 you seconds. Keep doing that for 90 seconds. And what that will do is it will reset your nervous system into actually being at a parasympathetic state, you'll find that you'll have greater cognition. You'll be able to think clearer because you're not activating from that fight, flight, freeze space where, or overstimulation, especially if you're like with internet and all the tabs we have open. I mean, I like to joke that this amount of open tabs on your computer is a sign of intelligence. And that's just because I have too many open. Um, but if you have the overstimulation of having all those open tabs and all those open thoughts and all those, um, what um, David Allen in his book, Getting Things Done calls open loops, which I like to think of, it just like slows down the RAM in your brain. Then 
it, it causes this clutter and to activate your parasympathetic nervous system that initially uh, allows your brain to shift into a more creative thinking. And so that's one tool. The second tool um, that I regularly use is uh, just a tool of awareness of like, where are you now? Because when you're in anxiety, you're focusing on either something that happened in the past that you're scared is going to repeat itself in the future. So a negative outcome, or if you're in a space of, um, anger or sadness, you're focusing on something in the past that happened. Neither of those are in the present. And it is only in the present moment where we actually can make positive forward motion and change. Um, so a, a moment of awareness of just taking a deep breath and settling into your body and feeling the support of your chair, feeling the how you are receiving the support of your chair, which is huge. We're very, uh, especially for women, what I see, and a lot of the men that I work with as well, they're highly nurturing and they're very good at giving support, offering their support to others, but receiving support, not so great at, and feel the shift in just your thinking. When you realize that you are seated, yes, but you are receiving support from the chair. You're just, and breathe into where you feel those touch points of the chair, feeling that chair supporting the weight of your body, supporting where you are right now in space, supporting where you are right now in time. That's um, the second exercise. And the third exercise is one of proprioception. And so when you are in, uh, foveal vision where you are like laser pointed forward. And you're only like, if you're looking at your computer or if you are looking at your phone, typically you're in foveal vision where everything is just into that space. If you can open up your perception into, um, your peripheral vision, then you actually are in a space where you're more present and what I found in seven years of working with high achieving leaders is that when they shift their vision into the periphery, they are actually, they actually cannot biologically focus on their internal problems. So if you look at a point in space, if you just look ahead of you and you take your hands directly in front of your face and then widen them out toward your shoulders as you're going back to the wall behind you. And then hold that space. Stay looking ahead of yourself, but look at where, like, see if you can notice without moving your eyes or your head, keep your gaze ahead of you. See if you can notice your hands. And then from that space, just notice your thoughts. And what I've found is, like I said, most people cannot focus on their internal problems as much because they've widened, they've literally biologically widened their perspective. So I have a couple more questions. I mean, this is very, very fascinating uh, information and uh, I know it's probably blowing some people's minds. So I'm so excited that we have a chance to, to teach uh, about this, these powerful uh, exercises and insights into reprogramming that that subconscious. You talked about something that I thought was very interesting. Um, is that any reaction that we have uh, has a ninety second like half life that it lives with us before uh, it's it's gone? Maybe explain if you could a little bit more about that, and then why or, or what is it that we're holding on to after that ninety seconds, and how again. Uh, we can reprogram our subconscious or our brains to 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 just let let it go, not not carry that that emotion with us after that ninety seconds. Yeah. So a feeling is a biological response. A feeling is different than a negative emotion. So something may stimulate you in your environment that stimulates a feeling of anger or sadness or fear, and the goal is, and that bio, so the goal is to have it move through your body. What happens and where people get stuck is when they identify with the feeling as being bad or good or 
um, positive or negative or right or wrong. So for example, let's say you grew up in a household, like my, my mother was very, very pragmatic when it came to feelings and she was not a big fan of big outbursts of emotion, um, nor was my dad. And I saw different firms, uh, ways of regulating emotion, none of which I would say were particularly healthy, but because of that, we learn our regulation from our caregivers and we only know how to co-regulate based on our caregivers and those are in our environment. And if our caregivers didn't give us very good co-regulation skills or the co-regulation that we needed, then we don't really have very good self-regulation or abil- or the ability to auto-regulate unless we were taught certain forms of auto-regulation, um, such as numbing or escapism, et cetera. And so when we are in, uh, so let's say, for example, you were taught as a child that big outbursts of emotion were manipulative or not good or, you know, bad. And so you are in your office and suddenly you feel you get an email and it hits your heart and it just, it, it hurts. You feel like you're scared, you're fearful. And suddenly your biology remembers that, that same negative emotion and all the identifications that you've had in the past. Again, why timeline therapy is super valuable because it just kind of clears and wipes that away. Um, It topples that Jenga set, but if you have experienced that and suddenly you identify, oh, this is a bad feeling. I have to like, I have to shelf it and you avoid it. You distract yourself from it. I can't, the whole, like, I can't deal with it now. It's not pragmatic. It's let me just distract myself. Let me turn on the TV. Let me do anything else, but deal with this feeling. Now, of course, we cannot always process every emotion that hits us because, you know, sometimes we have to do life. And so you want to make sure that you're in a safe space to process a feeling. Um, But if you don't allow that full feeling to fully biologically process, then that's where it gets stuck. So, and turn starts to turn into a negative emotion and that Jenga set rather than just being the biological response of stimuli. And so to process the biological response of stimuli, I love the process that's talked about um, by uh, Jim Deathmar and Diana Chapman of the Conscious Leadership Group in their book, The 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership, because it's on how to feel your feelings. It doesn't mean you identify with your feelings. It doesn't mean you say, I am sad or I am angry. Like you're not, you are not as a whole identity person. You are not an emotion. You may be feeling an emotion, but you are not an emotion. So it's a process of de-identification. And you first Notice, first notice if you're in a safe space to process it. So um, my children know, and I have this support with my kids and I have a five-year-old and a one-year-old that, you know, mommy's in process of like, if I feel something and I'm like, oh, I, I, I got to process this one. I will remove myself from their presence so that I can process and, and work this process that I'm going to share with you because, or I will hold them and let them process this and let them do what they need to do to process whatever emotion it is, knowing that they are safe and supported in, in a very, uh, I, I want to teach them how to regulate their emotions so that they have a range. And so if you're in a safe space to process, then you notice what is that feeling actually physiologically doing inside of your body? So that doesn't mean like, it's not good. It's not bad. It's like, is it spinning? Is it churning? Is it choking? Is it tightening? Is it squeezing? Is it punching? Like, what is that physical, physiological, actual feeling, the somatic sensation in your body? Allow, is it jiggling? Then attach a movement and a sound to let that work its way through your body. So I have worked with clients as, as we're in session and then I'll notice something coming up and something will trigger them. And um, I'll say, okay, what's, what's, what feeling it like describes to me the feeling. And they know like to describe the sensation instead of like, I'm feeling angry um, as it described to me the feeling. And so one of uh, I've had my clients have, mini toddler temper tantrums more than once. <laughs> They're like, oh, okay, I need to scream into a pillow or I need to stop my feet on the floor or I need to just shake my body and just uh, and let, let, let it out. But that allows your biology to process the, the feeling. 
And so that's one of my favorite processes so that it doesn't get stuck in the neurology. And it also doesn't get stuck in your own judgments or self-limiting beliefs about what is appropriate and what is not to feel. Um, your feelings are a hundred percent valid. They are true for you. And the greatest point of movement forward is acceptance of what you feel is, is real for you. It doesn't mean it's the absolute truth, but it's real for you. And accepting it in that moment is essential for moving forward because we can't move forward without accepting what is. We can't say, oh, I should be feeling happy about this, but I'm not. Like, let's say your partner... Um, doesn't plan anything for Valentine's day. And you think, oh, I, I, yeah. And you're really like, your feeling is that you're upset about it. Your, your feeling is like, man, I wish you needed cared, but you're like, no, I should be grateful. I have a really amazing partner. He's very supportive in all these ways. And that's your, that's where our conscious mind takes over to try to give us all the reasons to reason us out of what we're feeling. And unfortunately, our subconscious mind runs about 92 to 94% of our programming on a daily basis. And the subconscious mind is the domain of the emotions, not the domain of reason. So you can never reason your way out of a feeling. Feeling trumps thinking every single time. So instead of in that moment, using that example of you're disappointed because your partner didn't get you something um, or didn't do something special for you for Valentine's Day, instead of thinking, oh, I should be grateful or I should be, you know, happy that he's, you know, such a, a, a great person uh, every other day. Um, instead of that, allow yourself to accept the feeling of what is there, because from there, you can start to see how your perception is projecting out into outcomes that you don't really like. And you can shift your own internal projections, but you cannot do that when you're not in a place of acceptance of just what is inside of you. Just like I say, you can't run a marathon. You can't run a marathon. You're not literally running a marathon if you're shooting yourself. Like you're not at the starting line. You have to start at the starting line and go from mile one to mile two all the way through. So being on the sidelines with your shoulds, it doesn't work. So you have to start from a place of acceptance of what is and then from there, process what is to move forward to the finish line. Love it, love it, love it. Well, we didn't even get to talk yet about, we'll have to have you back, your best-selling book, The Start. So a final message before we wrap uh, that you want to leave with our audience and maybe a little personal message to, hey, Dr. Wyatt Wood Small. Uh, but yes, <laughs> what do you want to leave? What do you want to leave for our audience today? Well, to Dr. Wyatt Wood Small, I would say thank you for your work in this field. Like you're phenomenal. And to the audience, I would like to say thank you for doing the work and listening to podcasts like this, where you are actively taking the knowledge that you are hearing and doing the practices. So I encourage you, like knowledge is great and consuming knowledge is wonderful, but knowledge is really BS without implementation. And so take what you've learned today and from every podcast that you listen to allow yourself to implement that which you learn because that will increase your traction to the progress of becoming who you want to be and doing what you want to do and having what you want to have in this world. It is directly equivalent to the speed of implementation of the knowledge, not just the consumption of knowledge. Absolutely. And if people want some more knowledge and they want help implementing, where can they find you? Where can they go and, and uh, get on those interwebs to track you down? Just head on over to crownyourself.com and click the button that says work with me. And I'd love to continue our conversation. Love it. Love it. Well, it's been an absolute blessing that you found us, that we found you. And at the end of every episode of the Miracle Plant Podcast, we say heal the world because that is the mission to reach 1 billion people about the power of this miracle plant, especially in the raw form by 2025. And that, that allows people to take control of their health, whether it be body, mind, spirit, that true holistic healing that we all deserve and need. So on the count of three, we're gonna say heal the world. Ready? Here we go. Everybody listening and both Kimberly and I are gonna say heal the world. And we count to three, one, two, three. Heal, heal the, the world. world. All right. Well, thank you so much, Kimberly, for swinging by the Miracle Plant Podcast. And thank you for listening. If this resonates with you, like it, share it, review it, pass it along, and make sure you be a blessing. 
Happy healing. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. I'm Josh Kincaid, Capital Markets Analyst and host of your cannabis business podcast, The Talking Hedge, and newest member on PodCon X. So come on over and check out The Talking Hedge. We talk about business news, interviews, investments, events, all that stuff. So come nerd out with me over at The Talking Hedge. You can find me at the Talking Hedge podcast.com or on all your favorite podcast platforms. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, or don't, and I'm out.